So I think because we're such a small group that we can kind of sit at the table together and folks who are in the room all kind of have background on what's going on, but um, we can share background um, with yeah, do that folks who are on Zoom. Yeah. Um, and then we would love to engage you in a little bit of a conversation to um, sort of hear some of your thoughts and perspectives on, on what's happening. Um, does that sound okay? Will you either like put a yes in the chat or a thumb on your screen if you know how to do that with the reactions at the bottom? I'm going to come over here. Should we all just sit after Yes. 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 <laughs> oh yeah, that's okay. We, we, we can we can so we'll feel like we're at our table. Okay, great. I feel very included. Thank you for including me. Um. Okay, so here we are, strengthening climate resilience in ways. <laughs> um. So. Hello, Zoom. Uh, my name is Tyson Newkirk, and I'm one of the Conway School team members. And just love to welcome you to the meeting night, and really appreciate you showing up on a cold Thursday in the evening to talk about uh, kind of resilience and weight weight. Um, and we would love just to really quickly go around and hear folks' uh, names and what brought them to uh, come and have a conversation with us tonight. So. I can start. My name is Tyson Newkirk. I am a Conway School master's student, and I'm also a sustainable farmer and a logger who lives in Peterson, Massachusetts. I'm really excited to be working in collaboration with the Fire Resilience Planning Committee and um, you all to think about climate resilience. Pass it to. Oh. <laughs> I'm Nat Fortune, a town moderator. I'm Primarily here uh, as a concerned member of the town and physicist who teaches climate change, climate physics, and know how urgent it is that we address this. So I wanted to see what you had to recommend. Um, yeah, and I am uh, I'm here because, gosh, the Conway School said we'll do some work for you for free. <laughs> To make that work be as as impactful as possible for the reasons Nat said that this is really really important. I uh, said I should get involved to just help make sure that this really because uh, you can you can do things for free that are not worth anything, right? But if we give them some input, then their work is going to be so much more impactful and it's something we can build on for. Uh, getting future grants to take care of problems that we maybe identify or problems that we that are easy to solve now with a little bit of input and, and don't become a big problem later. So I sort of feel like that's what this is about. This is about finding uh, ways to solve problems easy when they're small. Yeah. Oh, I'm Joyce, by the way. <laughs> I'm Julie, and uh, Joyce is always a hard act to follow because she's so articulate. Oh. <laughs> I want like, so nice. Of Julie is the nicest of the lesson. Oh, of all of us. Yeah, just like Ford and a new member this year. Uh, I've lived in Wavy for about 20 years, and I've always been interested in the environment. And I very much appreciate how gorgeous Wavy is and how many wonderful elements of the environment we have at our fingertips and like to protect it as much as possible. Lovely. Thank you. Hello everyone on Zoom. I'm Smo. I'm one of the team members on the from the Conway School who will be working on this project, and I'm excited to be working with you all. I'm B. I'm also. Well, I'm sitting at the computer 
and also um, on the Conway team. And um, yeah, ha I'm already learning some things about Waitley and am uh, interested in doing climate resilience planning going, going forward in my life. So I'm grateful to be working on this with, with the lovely, the lovely <laughs> climate resilience planning committee. Such a mouthful. Um, are you all willing to come off mute and share who you are and why you are here this evening? Sure. Legal. Thanks. Yeah, I'm happy to come off mute. And my name is Dorothy Varon. I'm a Waitley resident. I live on the Roaring Brook. So, of course, I'm very interested in how climate change is going to affect the, 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 the Roaring Brook and how, you know, but I'm also just a, you know, a human being living on the planet. So uh, it's an important subject. I wanted to hear what this was about because I'm always interested in, um, you know, what, what folks are thinking and doing and, and trying to uh, problem solve um, in a, a fairly intractable problem. So um, I'm here to listen mostly and, um, and I appreciate that that this is happening. So thank you. I'm lucky I ran into somebody at the town dump, the, the transfer station, because I got the flyer. So I'm here and and um and I'm gonna listen. Thank you. We're lucky we ran into you, Dorothy. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Susan, would you be willing to go next? Sure. <clears throat> we also got the flyer at the dump. All right. <laughs> station, excuse me. Um, from Georgina, and very just curious, and mostly here to listen. My husband and I are eating dinner, so we're not really going to be what letting you see us eat. <laughs> that is okay. Seems but, like you all are in good company. <laughs> but we're very, very curious, and we love Waitley. We've lived here almost ten years, and and think it's like living in Vermont. It's absolutely fabulous. We love Waitley. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Okay. Oh, four. <laughs> wow, there okay. are four of you. Okay. Well, thank you for introducing us yeah. at least to your ages and that you yeah. love Waitley. And we are so glad that you are also here um, through the internet. So thank you. Oh, this is me. Um, so this is um, a visualization of this process that we're doing, um, who's involved and what the outcome will be. Um, so building off of existing plans, um, the Climate Resilience Planning Committee has brought us on the Conway School team to engage the community and create a small scale plan that will outline some actions that the town of Waitley can take to become more climate resilient in some way. I wonder, I know we moved the oh, tables over there. Should we was, knock over here? I'm just saying that. Just because I think it'll be easier for them to hear us if yeah. they're all around. Yeah, yeah. I think my angry. Yeah. And, and see us, I think. Okay. So we can move tables while you're talking. Yeah. Oh, what are we doing? I think we're just going to scoot this whole operation over. Or if we have a little bit. Or even just chairs. Like, do you all need the table? Like, we could just probably sit back around. Like, okay. Like this. Let's sit back around there. Does that feel okay? Back there. There. Over there. <laughs> really, anywhere, like in the sphere of this. We'll get back to pretending. Oh, oh that is there. a. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Select board meeting. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be Okay. Thank you. One more here. Oh, oh sorry. Can you shoot oh, there? Okay. okay, so this is me. Now the apple has to turn around and find all of us. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Do you want to promote? No, okay. you got it. Really. It's okay, but no, they come here. Sort of, well, yeah, somebody Sorry, else. I'm yeah. so confused by Somebody the else. round robin uh, <laughs> camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, okay. Great. Okay. 
So this is sort of a layout of the plans that have happened in the past. Um, has anyone on Zoom been involved in any of these processes? Maybe put in the chat if you if you've done if you've gone to any of the meetings for these. But um, back in 2011 was when you last updated your master plan. And since then, the Conway School has actually been involved in helping to design a more pedestrian friendly um, uh, town center area. And uh, most recently, you guys have gone um, and done a hazard mitigation plan, a plan for your open spaces, and also a MVP plan, the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness um, Program. I would have to say, as someone who also lives in a small town in Central Mattel in Massachusetts, <laughs> um, way to go on being current on your planning process mm, uh, yeah. really impressive so nice yeah. job team yeah were were you all involved in any of those plans i'm trying to remember <laughs> hard to remember anything before <laughs> 19, yeah, 2020 <laughs> <laughs> i remember speaking race i think we've probably been to a couple of yeah. them i wasn't heavily involved in in any of them there was there was one planning process we did for like the one for sidewalks and the mm -hmm. one that that we already identified Places where we'd want road improvements. That one I was more involved in, and I don't remember it, which name it is. That would maybe maybe more welcome last, and walkable lately. Yeah, that might be one Conway lost works with the town. So right. Really so cool. it was the plan that we made, and then that you guys helped. Yeah. yeah. So I was yeah. in the before that part. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um. So, you know, climate resilience is a term that has a lot of different definitions. And um, for the purpose of this work that we're doing, um, we wanted to work with a definition that was both comprehensive um, and also um, uh, hopefully articulate. So the ability of a community to absorb the stresses caused by climate change and maintain critical functions, as well as the ability of said community to adapt, reorganize, and evolve in ways that leave the community better prepared for future impacts of climate change. Um, so you often hear people talk about like mitigation for climate change versus adaptation. Those things can be housed within this definition. Um, and here also thinking about what is community. Um, obviously, we're talking about social communities here, and those can be at various scales, right? We can be talking about a neighborhood. In this case, we're talking about the social communities of the town of Waitley. Um, more broadly, we can talk about the state of Massachusetts, the nation, um, and we're also really focused on ecological communities. So again, those are across scales. We could be talking about the vernal pools here in Whaley or the broader wetland ecosystems or the entire Connecticut River watershed. Um, and the idea here is that these communities, both within social communities are interconnected as well as between social communities and ecological communities are deeply interconnected. Um, and that when thinking about climate resiliency and climate resiliency planning specifically, we need to be thinking about ways to, um, to uh, kind of make that inter interdependence more robust um, for future resilience. So in some of the plans, um, in the past, there were a variety of different things that were um, brought up as concerns that Waitley uh, needs to be thinking about. Um, but the top four that came out of the MVP plan were flooding and drought, um, as well as severe storms, and um, also the proliferation of invasive plants um, seemed to be a prominent concern. Um, but yeah, this is not the comprehensive list, just uh, kind of the top, top highlights. Um, so you all, the CRPC, have given us four questions to um, potentially guide this planning process. And we're in, we are trying to narrow it down to one to do a deeper dive on. Um, and so part of our hope for tonight is that um, we can get some input on it, uh, what that one might be that we will choose to do a deeper dive on. Um, so for folks on Zoom who haven't seen these questions before, um, the first one is about, is kind of asking like, what are social issues that are linked to climate change um, with housing as an example? Um, and what might we be able to do in Wheatley to 
support people who are going to be disproportionately impacted by climate change. The second question is about water quality and availability. Um, and it's kind of asking what conditions happen at the watershed scale. So not just like a single river or lake or aquifer, but at the scale of an entire watershed. Um, are there things that are impacting water quality and av availability, i.e. like drought and flooding? Um, and what could be done about those things? Um, the third is about conservation. Are there important natural resources, ecosystems, wildlife corridors that aren't currently protected now, but could or should be going forward? Um, and then the fourth is about climate change mitigation or like things that can be done to re reduce the amount of CO2 that is going out into the atmosphere. Um, so things like green energy or carbon um, storage programs. And that's maybe where we'll stop sharing because we're kind of gonna kind of go off script here, I think. <laughs> um, and I don't want to do that. Okay. Yes. Maybe just opening up a discussion about initial impressions on those four different kind of themes. Um, oh, we can open maybe the Zoom dialogue see if people want to chat just like free form off of mute if people are in a place to do that or if you're inserting um, comments in the chat. But um, maybe on initial impressions, we could bring the four questions back up and just say, see if people have any kind of things that immediately come to mind in any given topic. Um, it, before we do that, does anybody have any kind of questions about what we presented and what the process has been um, and whether it's like who the Conway School is or kind of where the town of Whaley is in this process that they want clarified before we go forward? Um, if so, just drop it in the chat or um, pop off in the news. Um, Great. The opportunity is always open. So this is a very, we're going off script a little bit because we have a smaller group of in person and on Zoom than we were expecting. So we want to get to like the real juicy parts of the meeting first and be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so. Um, so I guess the question is really like looking at, I'm going to share my screen again. So you all can see these questions. Um, is there a question or multiple that stand out to you as like, oh yeah, we really need to look into that. Or like, whoa, I do not understand that question, uh, but would love to understand it more. <laughs> um, maybe we could start there. Does that feel? Yeah. Okay. You guys have any things that stand out as? Well, I could start with each of the four. Yeah. Uh, with the first one, I, I used to be on school committee, and I we rely heavily on um, well, both families who have children here in Whiteley, and also in the surrounding communities who choose to come to the elementary school. Uh, we all, four of us, four towns feed into a high school, yeah, um, a middle school, and and so I imagine with the housing and also sort of associate expectations for the population in terms of school and school needs, um, and if there's um, if you're talking about a transitory population as well, how does that affect the school as well as the housing availability? Um, I don't feel up to speed in terms of 
what the pressures are on rental versus sure. residential housing yeah. lately right now. So, <clears throat> as far as the second, I imagine that's top of mind on a lot of people mm -hmm. since Whaley has once before gone through losing its water supply and having to find a new one. And that supply is, is already vulnerable from dangers of erosion, or streams that are passing yeah. through and mm -hmm. the wellhead. And also if needed to join two previously separate right. water yeah. systems in order to provide a reliable supply. Right. Uh, and so I'm sure that is a is a question um, for the water that's supplied to Whaley, as I imagine a lot of Whaley's, uh, Whaley's ground water sources are supplies for other towns like Um I I have the feeling that there's more of a wildlife corridor than there used to be continuously that is sort of certainly seeing more bear and turkey and deer and things, you know, throughout throughout the year. But I again I'm not up to speed as to how well connected that is or the areas that the animals are using, what the status of those is. We certainly uh, did some work with the, the Whaley Center Woods. For example, but um, it'd be a little hard for me to answer number three myself without really seeing what the map status is. Because mm -hmm. things can change a lot today. Yeah. Uh, and, and for the last, there um, coincidentally, there's a there's a group of students at UMass mm -hmm. who are trying to look into that very yeah. thing right now. Um, and I'm very interested in how we can do that actively to help mitigate things in addition to trying to be uh, resilient about them. I, well, we can't stop the changes that are happening. We could keep them from getting worse, but or, well, we could keep them from getting even worse than they're going to get. Right. Um, uh, and, but I, I have a feeling that um, I'm a lot less ignorant. I'm a lot <laughs> less, I'm a lot more ignorant about the first Three sure. current mm -hmm. is in terms of the first one. Um, are you all as individuals, or are you aware of general um, feelings in town of worrying about either housing affordability or impending development? Like, is that something mm -hmm. that is on people, your or people's minds? We think I, about so no somebody else on Zoom go yeah. for it Dorothy no no I didn't mean to interrupt it's hard to tell who's going to speak but please I'll go after the the person who was just about to talk that's fine I think I think we want to prioritize you speaking and then we'll go after yeah yeah. Well, with respect to number one, apart from the fact that that's just an, an issue, um, you know, uh, just broad cultural sort of societal issue, the question how it how it relates to climate change is, a, is I'm not sure of the direct connection. So that, that would be helpful to understand sort of are you looking at data that that, in, that has influenced this being sort of top of mind as opposed to just it's it's a it's a social issue that we have, but I wasn't sure what the link was to climate change. It seems to me that number two is is the number one concern that certainly mm -hmm. that that most people would have. We have to have water to live. So, to me, making sure that our water supply is um, is safe and clean and available, um, you, you know, that just seems like it would be top of mind for everyone. So. Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the social issues that are linked to climate change, such as housing, because I'm I'm not sure I'm well versed in that. You can maybe speak to that a little bit. Um, the way that one way of interpreting it, I think, is that going in the past plans, it seemed like there was a particular interest in trying to figure out in more depth who is vulnerable and the case of like an extreme event. So um, like there was an emphasis on uh, elder, elderly residents being able to know about um, hazards and have transportation to shelters or, or areas um, 
to be safe in those types of emergencies, whether it was like there's going to be a lot of flooding or there's an intense storm, power might go out, um, and trying to really have like an emergency preparedness plan um, and otherwise trying to figure out who else is vulnerable. And what was really interesting is in those plans, one of the kind of groups that was identified were you know the folks that don't speak English particularly well, which I think was part of um, the concern about migrant workers um, who happen to be in an inundation zone. Like a lot of the farms are in the a zone where if a dam broke, then you know there'd be a lot of damage. And trying to make sure that in the event of a hazard, word gets out. So I guess the social issue there is just trying to figure out who is most at risk and then um, trying to link that together and create equitable solutions, um, but also trying to figure out about how to make housing more affordable to folks. Sure, sure. Can I ask with vulnerability of septic systems, Affect that as well, like sure housing that no longer is habitable or yeah. I mean, I think there's also there's I mean there's there's a lot of different there's so many things housed that could potentially be sorry to use the word housed in that question. Um, you know, it could be partially yeah, like the just like the practicalities of infrastructure, right? If we have X number of houses that are in a flood zone or in soils that are more prone to maintaining maintaining like you know water log during rain events. Septic failures. Okay, great. Where what do what do current zoning laws look like for development? And where would would new how is like are the zoning laws promoting new development in places that will be more resilient in terms of increased um, flooding or heat stress? Are they are they encouraging development in places that might be um, you know not great in terms of the effects that climate change may have? Um, there are not like for us this kind of we're still kind of in this unco like uncovering process because these have been like we think these are like the community and the previous plan process been like we think these are issues we're like great but for the kind of one of the purposes of tonight and the other conversations we're having with community members is try to get as much like granular level um, concern as we can um, and not say we don't want to be like we think this is going to be an issue but like what is an issue for you so if it, if it feels like septic systems being um, you know, having Title Five issues because because of inundation from you know persistent flood water, then that is a real issue. Or you know, could be folks who are in the Harriman Dam inundation zone, right? And that's like a real housing issue. Um, are we gonna you know is the Waitley going to promote continued development in areas that might be you know susceptible to those types of um, impacts? Well, was it just choice? Maybe you know better. Um, Last year, we expanded the aquifer protection zone. Yeah. And in fact, we also voted in new floodplain maps, although yeah. the, the well, state we, and the federal yeah. government have not actually shown us what those maps are. Us, <laughs> us neither. So it's but really fun to map them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we voted them in. Yeah, they basically don't exist. Yeah, I, I, I'm that, sorry. So you, yes, you, you know that. Yeah. They were made in the 30s. Right. Uh, so almost 100 years yeah. ago. Wow. And they have not been updated. But we had to go through the motions of voting them in, yes, so that insure so that if people wanted to buy insurance, they could buy insurance. Yes, yeah. but at the same time, we yeah. did add some aquifer overlay districts. We yes, did not yeah. that yeah. I think restricted development more rather Correct. than enhanced it in yes. vulnerable areas. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. One question that came up around water was about drought and how like are people impacted and when drought has been bad or when it does get bad in the future like how will water be allocated how will those decisions be made mm. which i think is an interesting question to explore have you all been impacted by drought or is that something that you are worried about last year right yeah yeah, yeah. Um, outdoor water use right. right was curtailed yeah yeah um I mean, we're not California and Arizona yet, but right. that so we've not had to do things like not let people draw water um, who need it or want to, except for outdoor water, plant watering. So that's when I think when I was thinking of the water and climate change, where do they intersect? Is 
where do our farmers get their water from? They're not all getting it from our water system. Um, so where are, and if, like, what is climate change likely to do to the access of farmers to water? Because that's economic activity mm -hmm. in our town. Um, and uh, I guess uh, the other half is the, the folks who live here. What are the, what's climate change likely to do to our aquifer? Right, um, which is really part of a, a, the huge Appalachian Mountain Walk for yeah. Um, so, like, what is likely to happen to that, and what can we do? Um, I I think in some ways, when I like having been away from these questions for a while and coming back mm -hmm. now, um, it seems like the one that we have the most control over right. is how we respond with our water system. Mm -hmm. You know, it may need to expand to include more of the town. Mm -hmm. Right now, it serves like a half to two thirds of the yeah, town. Yeah. Uh, the higher elevations are not yet served, but right. they have other water sources there that are not that were not polluted in the 1980s when that all happened. Right. Um, but I like that's a really good question. I'm not sure that you can find an answer to what will happen, but you might be able to find an answer to what could happen to these aquifers and then what would be a strategy to to take care of that what would happen to what well whatever the source is that the farmers are using um, there's an upper and a lower aquifer and there's connecticut river right and they use those are sort of the too, three but... sources that i know about but you're going to be interviewing farmers yeah so. and there's also i mean there's interesting reality from a farmer perspective perspective particularly for food crops because there are new federal regulations about the water quality that you need to use if you're using for irrigation at a, at a federal level. And so mm. flow rates that are in, for example, flow rates in the Connecticut um, affect the level of various oh, surface water contaminants that are in there. Yeah. Um, and so that can affect the ability of a farmer to draw water um, legally for the pro for the irrigation of produce crops. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that, yeah, the changes in, in surface water irrigation availability would I would imagine have an impact on the extent to which those farmers are drawing from the public water supply, because also I think that as agricultural producers, they're not restricted by the outdoor water usage. Is that correct? You know, I guess well, we can... well, I think if you're turning on the tap right. from this, the right. town water, then you are. But I think most of the farmers are not using right. yeah. the town water right. at whatever outrageous price per gallon we charge yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's really cheap in your studies um of the environment and climate do you have any idea what's expected to happen in this area of the country and i say that because i was walking with a friend today and talking about drought and she said she understood that it was supposed to get wetter. So, However, a neighbor's well did go yeah. dry this past year. It had never gone dry in the 80 years. You can pull up at the end. There's a, a lot. Go. There's a yeah. slide that has projected water. Yeah. Anymore. So, so I think, I mean, that speaks to what Joyce was talking the, about. What the, might happen. the very brief synopsis of that, that's temperature. I think the third one is um, total precipitation in Franklin County. Um, so I think in general, um, the patterns that are projected is that the overall amount of water is not going to change a tremendous amount mm -hmm. if you look at the median line there. Um, but what seems to be happening and what's more pro projected is that when and how that water comes, particularly, well, in the summer, a pattern of longer dry periods yeah. with then um, more frequent large rain events, mm -hmm. um, which can be super problematic because you can have, which happened uh, last summer where you have drought conditions and then you get a three inch mm -hmm. rainstorm, right? Where the water is not, the, the ground is so dry that it's hydrophobic, it's not ready to receive the water. Uh, so you still get a lot of runoff, even though the ground needs water. Um, so there, and then in the, and that we're seeing in the winters as well, we're getting more rainstorms in December, January, February sometimes, right? Where we're having, you know, cold yeah. ground that's frozen and then we're having a large rainstorm and having runoff. So I think that in general, yes, it seems that this region is projected to have roughly the same, if not slightly more total water 
but the the patterns in which and this doesn't show the pattern this is just total precipitation but mm -hmm. a lot of the models are showing that the the um it's not the kind of nice one inch per week on average during the summer that historically was so uh, yeah. <laughs> uh friendly to uh, growing right. things in this part of the country yeah. Yeah. Right. right so so it, I, like i think one of our our emails or one of our meetings we uh, we're thinking uh, about water storage mm -hmm. because that's the way to handle that sort of thing if you uh, if you can um and it does remind me a student in my climate change course this past semester wrote a story wrote a, a paper um mm -hmm. contrasting how climate change is likely to affect water in bahamas because there's a lot of information we do a lot of work on that and nepal because she found a lot of information on that well, the, in Bahamas, I did not know this, that it is typical that every house has mm. water storage. Yeah. It's built in um, and into like the basement or wherever it happens. It's built in. So most people don't need drinking water from yeah. the town. Yeah. Um, and that the, the little lens of water that they're sitting on is becoming salt water. Right? Now, we're not in the middle of the ocean like like folks, but if if your groundwater is going to be threatened, then mm -hmm. maybe uh, one approach is to include water storage. Now, that's not obvious to me how to do that well. Um, and and I, I'm not sure that it's a short-term solution, but it might be something we have to think about in the long term, like water storage. Like when you get that big rainfall, you can store some of that and then have it come out. And I think well, that, gradually yeah. that's that's one solution, but I don't know if that's. I mean, yeah, th there's one. there's both there's kind of like the human infrastructure side of things, right? Like, what is our water system? Where are wellheads? Are those protected from you know from like right now? Yeah. They're to what extent? I mean, they're yeah, protected, to what extent? but yeah, to what extent? Um, yeah, and what is projected use and need of water from those resources? And then there's also I think there's a lot of ecological questions there too, like what eco. I mean. Waitley has a lot of protected land. Well, it has a tremendous amount of it, has a lot of wetlands. Um, uh -huh. What are the health and viability of the, the wetland ecosystems? To what extent does that, essentially, in thinking about like water systems from an ecological perspective as well? And I, I don't know enough about how those, like how those things are related to recharge rates of, of, of aquifers and things like that, but that could be a, an investigation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's going to be pretty slow for the lower aquifer. Mm -hmm. Pretty right. slow. Well, I mean, the, the the upper aquifer got contaminated. Right. Right. There's a lower aquifer, yeah. there, and so I imagine that it takes longer for water to cycle through the lower, yeah. lower down. That is coming from a broader region, right? right to catch it down yeah. into that. Yeah, and then even on an individual scale, there's a comment: rain barrels are pricey. Maybe a program for town to procure barrels. Like the old pickle barrels for homes to collect rainwater for gardens. Mm -hmm. I know Greenfield has a program that basically subsidizes rain barrels for individual homeowners mm -hmm. to make them like between twenty and forty dollars. I think. Yeah. Right. It reinforces what Joyce is saying that for farmers, it's going to have to be a larger scale. So yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 All scales. Yeah. yeah. Um. Any other kind of, I mean, it seems like we're talking, which is great, talking about water. Are there any other things that are front of mind for people thinking about kind of in drought, flood, water system, um, concerns around water in town? This, well, this is, I'm very long term and mildly paranoid. Great. Love it. <laughs> love, the pre, love the pretext. Social upheaval. Sure. Um, Mm. Folks out west running dry and wars over water, basically. I have a friend who lives out west and she said she thinks they have 10 years and then they're going to not have anything. Yeah, it's a little bleak. That's, yeah, I'm I'm actually from um, Utah and Denver. And yeah, she's from Colorado. Yeah. And that's where I'm actually hoping to do after Conway is going back there to try to address the watershed problems. Yeah, the Colorado River. Yeah. So yeah, it is pretty bleak. 
but maybe not something we can tackle. <laughs> in the next uh, project. <laughs> I don't think we can tackle it. I just kind of wanted to yeah. say it out loud. No, sure. It does look It's great to name the things that are in And it's like, yeah, well, we don't know what's going to happen. All right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and then it sort of becomes like, what are the social connections or networks that exist in town and in the region that that mm. could protect you as an individual or you as a town? Mm. You know, like what are the um, social processes in place to manage? And it's you know, yeah. it, it, we're I live as I said, I live on the Roaring Brook. Let me turn on my camera to to talk to everybody. I live on the Roaring Brook, and I and and I don't know the individual who was just talking about this, but you know, I'm a I, I sort of think about that too. You know, when the apocalypse comes, everybody's going to want the water that's on this land because there's a lot of water running all through the land. Um, and I wonder about you know, I mean, at, at some point, whether the government says, you know, what that land belongs to us now because there's water on it, and and we're going to take it. Um, so, you know, I mean, there are, the, you know, I can go to, to like great, ex, you know, take, take, taking my land and, you know, all of that stuff that the government can do when they declare that they are ready to do it. And yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's, you know, I, I, I often worry that because it's such a valuable commodity, it's maybe not so safe to be living right on top of the water here. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's an interesting viewpoint. Wow. Uh, well, it seems better than not living. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, the balance is, of course, we have we have water and we feel blessed because we have water. And then and then when you think about the fact that it is such a precious commodity that is becoming more and more scarce um, in the world at large, then then it's it's the it's the other side of that blessing. But right now we're we're grateful, of course, and and. Um, and and there is a reservoir. Of course, you all know that there's a reservoir right above us that feeds it into South Deerfield. So the right. Deerfield water system, you know, comes is is captured up there and then is delivered to to Deerfield, South Deerfield. Um, so it's a very important water source source right right around where we are here on North Street. Yeah, it does seem like of the four questions, we're really focusing on water. Oh, water. Yeah. yeah, and I feel like there's a couple reasons for that. Um, but that to me, the one most front of mind is we have our own water system <laughs> that we could control and we could protect and so on. And things like housing is such a huge problem mm -hmm. everywhere that uh, whatever we could, little we could do in Waitley doesn't seem to be um, that big a thing. We do have lots of social supports that still need improvement um but i maybe people feel like we like we have a great senior center senior center director and the, the and they're forming those networks among especially the at-risk seniors right um so uh not that there's nothing to do there but we do have another planning grant going on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the with the where south county seniors is taking the lead on it uh, we've had groups coming in to help us put green energy in, uh, make a plan for the town. Um, and uh, two and three are in some ways overlapping. Right. I think that they're, they talk to each other. So I, I guess I think that what the, there's some things I'm trying to tease out from what I'm hearing about water. I feel like there's one is kind of what is our current water infrastructure as a town, right? Who is on town water? Um, who's on private well, who's drawing surface water in the case of farmers, kind of really what is the existing state of our water infrastructure? Um, what are the assets and vulnerabilities maybe within that water infrastructure as it currently exists? Um, and maybe what are some potential ways that the water infrastructure could be more resilient in the future? So thinking about I mean, there's any number of things that could come up from that. So that sounds like kind of one bucket that I'm hearing. Um, another one is a little bit like how does the broader, like how, do eco, how does the broader ecosystem and aquifer, um, you know, essentially how, do, how, do, how does the ecology of, of Waitley um, um, 
influence the the quality of water and the supply of water? Yes. So um, if um, <clears throat> if there was a magnesium Magnus. Magnus Magnus is the right. water yeah. point and it's been mitigated, but right. you could imagine something else. Sure. But I think we're we're maybe just as elected officials we're worried yeah. a bit about large scale economic vulnerabilities due to changes in this. Like even if you have an average amount of water, you sure. Take, yeah. Because if the fluctuations are heavy right. in the winter and yeah. low in the summer, might mean, for example, that wells become unreliable. Right. If they and become unreliable where they are, um, for farmers, they somehow we're going to need help be able to develop cisterns or something mm -hmm. for them. And in the West Waitley, that would mean an expansion of the water system, right? right? If, which is not without cost. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And on yeah. similarly, if the water, if changes in the aquifer system, and the, the broader ecological system yeah. by involving the wetlands and the mm -hmm. like were to mean that septic became unreliable. Sure. We're yeah. one of the few towns that has no, no sewer septic. services at yeah. all. My fancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and and towns, nearby towns with sewer systems are also having a lot of trouble yeah. uh, in avoiding contaminating the river and mm -hmm. in, uh, mm -hmm. maintaining a quality of treatment with floodwaters. Right. Mm -hmm. But that would be a very large expense again. Sure. Like how yeah. the, we would need to be prepared for and know what the, you know, exactly how much, like a sure. capital equipment, like exactly how much of a rainy day fund yeah. needs to, as it were, yeah. needs to be. <laughs> Set aside That's why they've always for that, that kind of mitigation. Are yeah. we more? Is it something that is a bigger risk than in the past? Right, that we would need to yeah. plan for. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that the, these are easier for us to envision, but I'm sure they do depend on. Well, I think the that environment is changing. More yeah, better. I mean, it's almost like a like a water resiliency plan, right? right? And that's looking mm -hmm. at what are what are climate change based things that. Um, but it are likely to affect right. um, kind of the broader water system in mm -hmm. Waitley, um, groundwater, surface water, um, and then, yeah. We had little tiny things like because of the drought, the pumps had to work harder and burned out mm -hmm. and couldn't get replaced, you know. Yeah, for, for, the, for the public water supply. For some of the distribution. Yeah. Right, right. I think this path, the various pump problems have happened at various times. But putting those filters on made the pumps have to work hard. Oh, sorry. Oh, because <laughs> uh, right, there's more resistance coming. Uh, and through, I, yeah. yeah, and and so that was one of the uh, one of the reasons we we might not have had to have water restrictions as long as we did, mm. um, because that the that system the the fact that we had to put these filters in made the existing system need more pumps. Right. So in a way, right. that culverts need to be larger sure. and bridges need to be stronger. Right. Do we need New specifications for that yeah. for mm -hmm. that system. I, yeah, but I, I'm I'm very concerned about the broader changes to to Waitley. I my I have a deep concern that we're going to lose the sugar maple, right? So yeah, I, and you I know, think I, I think it may be it's inevitable in a few decades. Yeah, um, but um, based on. As somebody's the, completely yeah right. We're, we're, they said you don't just, do sugar maples in Pennsylvania, and we're right, getting that close. Right, you you have to have a long enough period of cold, cold yeah. weather, and then you need a, a cycle of warming and freezing. And then if, if you have a early warming for a long period, then then the tannins come out and, and it becomes bitter. Yeah. So uh, you have uh, you end up not having the conditions for good sap. For and, and or you end you end up having a very short season. Yeah, okay. Right now, because things get warmer sooner, you have more of an extended season. But eventually, that will yeah. uh, be in, impaired. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, the uh, like sugar maples versus red maples or so. Um, you know, sugar maples are going to have to migrate northward. Mm -hmm. with the climate. Essentially, like we're at the we're at the, the southern edge right. of their right. preferred yeah. range right yeah. now, uh -huh. yeah. and yeah. as the climate warms, that preferred range migrates northward very quickly. And projected by twenty fifty, that really 
that southernmost boundary. Even obviously the trees aren't going to get up and walk away, but their health and vitality and their right. ability to um, produce. Right, and the edges, if, as the forest can more fragmented, yeah. you end up with more red maples around the side, mm -hmm. and sugar maple percentage drops. Yeah. So okay. anyway, so that's my entire knowledge of, <laughs> of that. But that's, I mean, that's but the part of the character of this film you know, is of people being able to uh, tree farmers in my you know, experience, right? Farmers having a, yeah. a winter crop, as it were, yeah, by right. like being able to do that, yeah. right? There is a question in the chat to kind of go back to solar, mm -hmm. um, around could someone address the solar array by the transfer station? And if the grid was down in a major storm, is there any system possible to utilize that electricity? I'm totally in the dark on this. Oh, uh, we don't have any battery backups, and now no, right. but. Yeah. New systems, the state is strongly encouraging to have battery backup. Yeah. Um, and you could imagine as this transportation structure moves to electric transportation, um, it's possible to make cars storage sites right. as well as yeah. consumers, and you could you could buffer that way. But right now, there's no. If the grid goes down, that goes down. That is also happening. yeah right yeah. Is and that that's, part that of array has been put in was put in in like twenty twelve ish I mm -hmm. think. Do you have to put in a fully new array to get it a battery? Or you no, like you no, can no, add no. a battery backup to an existing yeah. system? No, but no one will sell you one. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we we have a little. We experience didn't have a lot, but we were probably the first post people to put in PV and wait. Yeah. Um, and then we during we had a Whaler Solarize thing, which added a lot. And we sort of, and we maxed out, like so there's really not much more we could put in terms of ground matter or roof mount. And so we can't get anyone to give us batteries because they want you to sell, sell you solar on your roof at the same time, right? Otherwise, it's not as economical for them. Uh, but now, on the other hand, there's concerns where there's company coming in that's like one had like one solar panel and then uh, 20 megawatt hour battery or something. It's really that they're just doing batteries. Right. Huh. And that's going to be needed, but the, the balance and where that should go is, is a current issue. I yeah. Would say. Is and, that part of what the UMass team is looking into for this in the solar? I think they're far enough along. They, I, yeah, I don't know how far along they are. Okay. Um, but, but Paul is on your list of people to talk to. It's, talk it's, to this morning. it's, oh, okay. it's yeah, an okay. issue that's come up before. The zoning board, for example, um, what balance between solar production and energy storage should there be for it to be optimal and for it to be a source, you know, night in and, and day, uh, and, and what uh, the restrictions should be because the ideas of setbacks or uh, are, are quite different for um, the production and, and the battery storage, right? Got it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. It, it might yeah. be that it's much. Anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. Right. It, yeah. I think it might be. Uh, will you go back and say the question again? The question that started this conversation? Oh, about solar? Yeah, the one in the chat. Yeah. Um, uh, one in the chat. If the solar array by the transfer station, oh, yeah. if the grid was down in a major storm, is, yeah. it, is there any way to access that? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, we already answered that question. Okay. Yeah. Good. yeah. yeah. I think that's yeah, there's two things you need: the battery storage, um, but also you you kind of have to. There's something called islanding, where the problem is you have AC electricity that you need to generate, yeah. and it should be in phase with what's on the electrical line. So right now, the systems that most people have on their homes synchronize with that, right. but they require the grid to be active in order to see a signal and be in phase. Yes. Um, and so if you sent something out, there would need to be some way of making sure that... Um, we're, getting, we're getting a little loud. Oh, all right. I, anyway, I like I, I, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. you, you have to pay attention to the connection yes. between the grid and the part that's being generated there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you could just wait till it goes down and turn it on and then turn it off. <laughs> I 
Oh, yeah. Stand by the box. Right. Yeah. I'm sure that the utilities would have a lot to say. Yeah. 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 I would make that happen. Yeah. And I feel to, yeah. to, to some extent, we don't have, That's not as it. a town, a lot of control over that. It's really important. But as far as if, if our meeting is about yeah. sending you a signal, <laughs> yeah. uh, well put. Right. Yeah. What yeah. I'm hearing is that, that uh, it might be that we water seems well, to resonate with people. Maybe the other folks who've been listening in might chime in a word or two to see if they're kind of hearing what I'm hearing in this meeting. Um, especially the family of four. Yeah. <laughs> Can I chime in or? Sure, please. please. Well, I think uh, you're right. Water seems to be the number one issue. We do, I think Whaley's ahead of the curve as far as solar, the amount of solar that this town generates and the solar fields that we have. I mean, a lot of the farms are generating electricity on their own and, you know, um, compared to, you know, other communities. But, um, you know, being an agricultural community, water is the key to life. It's key to growing everything and whatever. And I get a kick out of the fact that South Deerfield is here in town and Northampton's water supply is over West Waitley. And we don't have a reservoir. We have wells and wells can run dry. So, yeah. Um, that to me, I think, is either water storage, um, water delivery is here in town, um, but uh, definitely water storage. I mean, it happened this, I think it was past summer, the tank went dry. The pumps shut off, and there's nothing worse than coming into your house and turning on the faucet, and nothing happens. No. That is scary. So, I mean, um, electricity. How many people have generators in this town? A lot. So that, you know, if the grid goes down and again, the ice storm back in the October storm, the uh, Halloween storm there, whatever, um, you know, the lines went down. The ice took the lines down. Solar backup or battery backup isn't going to help you if the delivery system is on the ground. Um, so unless you're self-sufficient. Yeah, you need to have it in your house like yeah. a generator. Yeah, Good right. point. Yeah. yeah. And again, with, with the solar, we have the option of putting batteries in our own homes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that I think that's an individual choice. Yes. So um you know the, the power, I think the uh again, I think you're right. The number one issue that we would have as a community is gonna be water. I mean our our Farmers need water. Farming is a major output of this community. And, um, you know, if the crops at which they ran in with drought last year, and, uh, you know, they, a lot of farmers here were in distress because of that. All done. <laughs> right. So, like, as far as rain, should farmers be seeking to grow something other than what they are, right? You know, what's the advice for crop resilience? Yeah. Well, everything everything needs water. Uh -huh. yeah. What crop you're dry, you're, you're growing. Yeah, some, yeah, some can grow with less than others, but yeah. You know, I mean, we've got, we, we, we've got the greenhouses so we can start, you know, the process of growing earlier because we're in New England, I think. And, you know, this, the sun is whatever, you know, even in February or March, they can be growing stuff in the greenhouses, but they need water. They're not going to grow anything in those greenhouses without water. So I know uh, our next door neighbor, uh, the Sandersons on their farm down at Long Plain Road, um, they get delivered with their tomatoes They've they got a bacteria in the water. Well, it was from the fertilizer that was in the water that they used to fertilize the drip tubes, and it killed every tomato plant in the greenhouse. So it doesn't take much as far as any poison or, or any type of thing in the water supply to give you all kinds of issues. And we ran through that with the magnesium here in town. 
Yeah. So. And then to your point, Julie, even the reservoirs can run dry as the west, right? Yeah, the reservoirs. Well, not just the aquifers run dry, but the reservoirs themselves can. Yeah. Right. I was thinking one of our neighbors down the street, I live on Conway Road in West Waitley, her well ran dry and she ran, their neighbors ran a hose to her mm. all summer long. And then she had a well dug, but I was like, so you, she can afford to have a well dug. What if somebody's water well runs dry and they can't? Yeah, they right. there, there was water being trucked into Waitley for several years, right? I don't remember. I wasn't we were right here before that. During the time yeah. I contend, yeah. 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 Was that Manganese? Manganese. No, no, yeah. that was that was eighty five when the upper were oh. the Temec had been recommended to use on potato crops. Yeah. Uh, but amazing. it turned out to be causing skin rashes and yeah. bird defects and things like that. Wow. And so the, the upper water water tried to be discontinued. And during the search for a new one, their water trucks were coming in to bring water to people with wells in that area. We can take it far away. Yeah. I'm wondering if we could maybe, as as we hold water in front of mind, talk a little bit about question three and seeing if there's any kind of connection here, like between conserved land and existing <laughs> ecosystem connectivity. If people are kind of, if there are any connections that folks have for that with respects to both on its own and also in in in, in the context of thinking about water and water systems in town. Um, what did we put up? Yeah, I guess we have we have the map. On yeah, do we have your well, on? Yeah, right. I, I'm not sure this is a group of experts sure. on that, but but just but most it. like the top of mind. Well, yeah. if if we need a like a large area to store water, yeah, existing wetlands might be a candidate. Now it would change the nature of the wetlands if the water were much deeper, and I don't I know anything about. Like, what would it take to have a surface water reservoir for farmers in Waitley? I, I don't even know if that's a good idea, but it seems like um, if you're having to, to store, if it's really going to be a drought and huge rainfall, which is, I think, what we're seeing now and we're supposed to see more of, it, then water storage seems to be the thing to do. And that is would presumably have to happen in places where um, we already kind of have some water, you know, or maybe it shouldn't, maybe it shouldn't well, happen there, but what, would those be, would some of those places be candidates for, you know, building something that would hold water? As uh, when it, water already right, so, so we, yeah, so all this water that runs off into brooks, can would it be worth considering having that runoff go Somewhere else, so the brooks don't flood necessarily, and maybe go uh, someplace where it could be released more gently, either into the brooks or into the farms, you know, where it's where it's needed. I mean, what kind of water control system? You're going to be talking to Keith. We know that. Yeah, you're talking <laughs> like storm water to run off. Well, yes, yeah, right. When when the when the water comes public, down, in, like yeah, when water comes down in great amounts. And you get lots and lots of runoff. That's the thing that causes the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So, is there a way to slow it? Um, slow yeah, or, or ha yeah, every so often you have a place to store it. That changes the ecosystem, though. So, it would not be preservation in their current state. Sure, conservation. Yeah. Well, already in, in some parts of East Whaley, where there's a lot of farms, depending on how. The land is plowed or tilled, it can lead to runoff affecting nearby housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that has happened in cases. Right, that yeah. there, yeah. there's already in some of the farming areas a need for stormwater runoff protection or things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think something that my my most recent professional background is in is in organic vegetable and forage production and that's the what we often say is the best place to store water is in the soil right mm -hmm. um, and soil health and that's not just for agricultural systems right. it's also if we think about more the broader landscape and what systems are permeable and and, and what yeah. how healthy are the soils and the plants that are living there um, because that has a tremendous yeah. impact on how quickly water is able to percolate into the soil but also 
how well the water is held in the soil profile to make it more available during mm -hmm. times of water stress. So mm -hmm. kind of more broadly, kind of soil health and soil mm -hmm. ecosystem health can be a huge part of that kind of broader, um, in addition to obviously like things like um, healthy wetlands and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Um, so, and it's, and Whaley's interesting in so far as it has like relatively for, you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of impermeable surfaces from the kind of like standard definition, right? Of like mm -hmm. buildings and, and cement. Right. Um, but a lot of the things that we don't actually map as permeable, impermeable surfaces are things like, you know, a really hard packed lawn is is not actually super permeable, yeah. for example. So, anyway, yeah. so so kind of one of the things I kind of heard you saying is that, like, I put in terms of that, that this water storage idea is, one, it may not necessarily be water storage, but water slowage, <laughs> so that um, you have it there in the, you know, keep putting it into the soil, you get a big rain event that stores water, and if you can somehow store it, and, but let it, when it, when it gets to be dry, yeah. you're just continually letting it go into the soil so that when the next big rain event comes, the soil is actually re ready to do its job and, and absorb it. It's healthy enough and you still have a way to store it so that when you get to that drought period, you can, you can make it. It's, it's sort of trying, you're trying to even out this. To the, that, you know, to, to the extent that you know, to the extent that you can, and yeah. It's limited, so what? It's yeah. limited by soil type. It's limited by vegetation. Right. But there are, yeah. Things so, are. so what are potential strategies for doing that? And thinking about, yeah, it means like thinking about the ecological storage capacity as well as the the you know man, yeah. human made, human made <laughs> infrastructure, which is which yeah. is you know they're they're um, I think that we're probably in a time and space where they're those things are going to need to be. Inter, interrelated and, and um, simultaneous. Right. Um, but Waitley's in a really, it's so interesting that the, the way that Waitley's oriented in the landscape with having hills, but also yeah. having the floodplain and yeah. those different types of ecosystems are all kind of contributing, I think, to what this greater question yeah. is in terms of groundwater recharge and, and like surface water health. And so, well, on like the health of the floodplain forest too, like that, that, that is, and that's not so much. That's more like broader ecosystem mm -hmm. and water quality type of stuff. Um, and you're in a region, fortunately, where people are starting to think at the watershed scale, um, which is really neat from uh -huh. a, a planning perspective. Um, is there anything around like political decision making about? water in times of scarcity that we want to think about or that we should know about or that we should know oh. about i feel like there was i feel like that was kind of part of the initial yeah. question maybe from yeah i forget who brought it up in one of our initial meetings but I remember brian being concerned about being like yeah it's really hard. like i don't i want to know what to do when the water restrictions come in because it's a really difficult place to be when you're trying to decide right. if you we don't water. really have a water mm -hmm. police right right yeah so um I, I think that would those would be interesting questions to uh pursue as well. I think um when you said political, the first thing I thought of was well, uh, geographically half the town's on water and half's not. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And, yeah. and I don't know if the population wise, if it's more like two thirds, one third. Right. But uh you know, the town took out the loan to right. get the water system put in. Sure. So people who don't have water mm -hmm. on the water system have been paying through their taxes to help get this water system in. And it may be that, you know, it may be that in the not too distant future, we have to do the same thing for the folks who are not on the water system. It might be relatively easy to protect the water system we have, but the need to extend it mm. is, is something that we have to at least think about. Um, if there's uh, you know, wells running dry in West Waitley is becoming maybe it's something that uh, that extending the water system isn't the right solution. Maybe there's a different solution that's good, but we, you know, we should be responding to that as a town and the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, so when you said political, that's the first thing. Sure, I got it. but yeah, that's, yeah. Great. that's a great. <laughs> yeah. 
first reaction, best reaction. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. even just connecting the two water systems that we had. Right. There was a hookup charge to bring the old small tent center of town one On. to connect it to the rest, right? And so that was a political yeah. decision about how much is borne by the individual homeowners, how much is borne by the town. And and I'm sure that would that would come up again, or how to provide financing for people who can't afford that right away, or right. things like that. Yeah. Um, I think I can't think of another way that it's going to come. You know. You know. Yeah. Um, the you've already mentioned that tight land uses are different, right? Right, but yeah. that's just because the East Whale and the was also was where was originally an ancient lake, yep. right? yeah, right? And, 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 and there, there's a reason it's such fertile soil sure. there, yeah. Um, and, and where it was rock and sand draining <laughs> into the lake, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not growth, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's different stuff, yeah. You can, so, to, 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 what, to what extent, um, I have a question, in I just to what extent does um, does cooperation of surrounding of surrounding areas uh, play into how effective we can be? So I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. You know, somebody mentioned invasives earlier. You know, I mean, in, we we we've we've battled the invasive battle for a very long time, and and no matter what we do, because because everybody isn't battling invasives, it's hopeless. I mean, I really it, it is a hopeless battle because. It has to be all, you know, all for one kind of thing. And if we're dealing with the invasives, but our neighbors aren't, it doesn't, it doesn't much matter what we're doing. So I don't know if the same pertains to how, you know, trying to protect water and watershed land and all of that. Uh, if if we don't have neighbors who are doing similar kinds of things, so that what we do, it has a, you know, there's a there's a broader impact by having more and more. Um, communities involved. So I guess the question is, to what extent is it really important to be working cooperatively with other communities so that they are similarly planning and finding solutions and, you know, trying to conserve, you know, and, and preserve uh, their water supply? One thing that's cool about, well, so like the Deerfield watershed has some regional collaborators who have made a plan around a sustainable watershed. Um, and that was like a cross town boundary. So there is, there are like, the models there's of precedence. That. Yeah, there are precedents, which is cool. And I feel like this area is like with the Franklin Regional <laughs> Council. Yeah. 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 yeah, there is like existing, there are um, pre existing connections. Yeah. to collaborate around which is cool and i think that i think that's a really great point i think the interesting thing is the that there actually are a, a number of smaller watersheds that are fully contained within the political boundaries of waitley yeah um, and that those those watersheds nest inside of each other right so yes obviously we're a part of the much broader and larger connecticut <clears throat> river watershed which mm -hmm. is you know multi-state and many municipalities um and there's only a certain level of influence that Wheatley can have on that, but there are, I think, everywhere from individual level yeah. um, member in town to the smaller watersheds within town, and then how that contributes to the larger watershed. I think there's some really, potentially some really interesting yeah. opportunities to look at those different scales. Yeah. But yes, artificial political yeah. borders that don't correspond to ecosystem is yeah. a challenge in thinking about climate resilience. Yeah. Yeah. You're sorry. feeling Yuri like, on. No, 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 no. I sorry, it's timely. It. <laughs> it's timely. But I oh, feel it's almost eight. And it's almost eight. So I guess we should start wrapping up and just wanting to give people a last minute chance to say anything you want to say or ask before we wrap up. It feels like we're landing in a place of it seems like we're gonna focus on water, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Folks on Zoom, any final questions or thoughts before we say goodnight? I'm just curious, uh, there's so few of us here tonight. Have you had more meetings where there were a lot of people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. This, yeah. Is a, this is a pretty um, short lead time up to this meeting. And this so, is the first one. Yeah. And this is yeah. the first one. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah. we will, we are having, we will have another, we have another one scheduled yeah. for 
February, February 27th, Monday, 6.30 to 8.00. Um, and then also we're Tell the, everyone you know and we'll be doing some more publicity and we're also we're having uh, one on one interviews with a lot of folks in town yeah. um, who um, have particularly for folks who like have specific uh, in, uh, kind of um, knowledge, about, knowledge about, a particular and thing in town. about a specific you know so talking to the water superintendent talking to the highway superintendent talking to Scott Jackson who is at UMass and is the chair of the conservation committee talking to yeah. farmers in town, talking to organizations that work with the farming community in town. Um, so trying to do some targeted um, reach out and interviews with yeah. folks um, and try to get as much input as we can, um, yeah. knowing that any process is imperfect and complete, but trying to get as many voices in the room as possible. Yeah, yeah and there's a core group. There's four people who have volunteered. We've had three, two meetings before this with the Conway School folks, and part of that was brainstorming, who are the people that they need to sit down with one-on-one -on -one to, to get their information? So tonight's meeting was really to focus on getting input from the whole community um, out, you know, because we don't know everybody, <laughs> and, uh, and it's important to get input from people to see what's on your mind. And if, you know, hearing that, that you, Hearing what you've had to say, it was really, I think, helpful. Hearing, even if it's just a small group of us, mm -hmm. um, and we're not all the experts, the experts are going to be one on one. So. Well, it's yeah. been very informative. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Very thank much. you so much for coming. Thank you for attending. And if you guys have, if you're like, oh man, you should really talk to so and so, feel free to say it or type it into the chat, and we'll make sure to reach out to those folks as well. Or not even necessarily, even if you just know people who like would be willing to talk to us as residents of Waitley, like they don't have to be experts in any particular thing. I think we're interested in a breadth of voices being. Yeah. Um, informing our yeah, work. And everyone's an expert in their experience as a resident of the town yeah. lately. So. And, and the, yeah, absolutely. On, on Zoom, if I just pointed out, everyone will understand the importance if you're talking about water. Right. Yeah. And that it, that everyone can see why it's going to be important. So it seems like a nice place to start. Yeah. What happened? That's amazing. <laughs> hey. Um, yeah, just sp sp spread the room, spread the rumor that the water rates are going to go up, and watch the town come out of the woodwork. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they'll they'll show up. <laughs> uh, I think someone just did that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, there you go. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Thank evening. You.